so Ashok, thank you for joining our, uh, you know, our, our webinar. We are really excited to have you, and, and as well as you are presenting Tide to join this webinar, where we're really looking forward to hearing, you know, your story on um, your journey to finding the right solution to enable continuous testing, continuous integration, and delivery. Thanks, Julius. Thanks for having me for this webinar. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, yeah, and uh, just about me, I have close to 14 years of experience in IT. I started my career as a developer, and then for the last 12 years, uh, I have been doing what I love the most, which is testing. Uh, in my current uh, role, I'm working with Tide um, as a senior QA engineer, and my primary area of focus is uh, driving the test automation strategy uh, within Tide. And I've been tied with over one year now. Uh, so, so my name is Julius. I'm, I'm the senior solution engineer from Perfecto. And uh, I've had over a decade of experience in software engineering, pre-sales and pro-sales, uh, and of, of course, um, you know, test automation as well. So, uh, so I'm really excited to be sharing this session with um, Ashok today. So, so maybe tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, the, the vision of Tide and, and, um, and also, you know, what are the, the, the key uh, products or the, the key vision for, for uh, the key target audience for, for Tide, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, so many of uh, the audience, they may not know about us. Uh, so just for, uh, for them or for you who are present in this uh, webinar as attendees, uh, we are leading a digital bank, uh, business banking platform. That essentially means we are not actually banks, but we are a, a platform which help the members, uh, which I'll just tell about who our members are to do what they love the most, to do their business, right? Uh, so pretty much our platform provides uh, a banking solution for all the small and medium uh, scale entrepreneurs uh, so that they can save their time and money on their banking and admin. So pretty much that is our mission. So as I just explained that our members are pretty much from uh, the small and medium scale businesses and how we are helping them. So as you know, getting even just an account open with a high street bank can be a time consuming task. But the same you can do with us, uh, open a business account in within a minutes, right? At the same time, we provide you the very safe solution to have fast uh, domestic and international payment. We provide you with the services of invoicing. Uh, you could do your expense management with your team members. We also provide the team card so that if there are uh, your business has employees, you can pr pretty much provide them the team cards and uh, you can manage their expenses. At the same time, recently, we have also introduced credit lines where we can support you when you uh, need in terms of like small loans here and there to help uh, you know grow your business. And the latest feature of this being automated invoice match matching, where if you spend some money out of that, where you feel that it's a business transaction, so pretty much you can attach that uh, transaction, or it you can automatically attach that transaction to one of our one of those invoices, right? In addition to that, there are many more features, but I will not bore you with that, and uh, we will go to the exciting stuff later. Yeah, we will just see some examples of you know how uh, anyone could um, open a business banking account in minutes, and uh, the way the application flows, and is definitely cutting edge as well. The technology that is being used. So uh, in terms of Perfecto, we are under the, the Perforce umbrella. So Perforce provides um, uh, products, I think about 14 brands over uh, covering the, the, uh, the full software development life cycle. So providing solutions for true back box. Perfecto falls into the automation uh, category in providing a cloud device platform for automation and for scaling very easily. So, um, so there are a number of key lessons that we're really uh, excited to, to hear from the shop today. And uh, the, the first, obviously, is to understand how, uh, how Tide, you know, why Tide had the need to look for extending or to, to begin with automation, first of all, I mean, obviously, they went through the journey of looking at the various ways to do automation and then uh, into looking for, to extend the coverage for, for both web and mobile and automation and then um, and, and then we will look at how they, they, they had the ability or well, they, they had the, the, um, they, they went from you know going from many many hours of mundane manual testing to automating majority of the regression as well as smoke test packs and, uh, and and into you know shrinking everything into minutes and be able to have fast feedback uh, and, and make instant decisions and then 
Uh, we will also look at how, you know, what are the challenges, what were the challenges they faced, uh, and whether there are still challenges they're facing, and uh, how they overcome those challenges, as well as what is the future, you know, what, what does the future look like for uh, Thai. So, so perhaps a short, if you can maybe just, just let our audience know, or, or, or show our audience what were, you know, what was the, the previous day, you know, how you did testing previously. And for example, this um, opening account. Uh, so yeah, so this will pretty much uh, tell you how uh, we did the testing before, because this video is pretty much from our testing, the manual element of it. At the same time, it will show you how uh, some of our features work and what and why the automation were needed for them. So if we can just start the video. Uh, so this is the landing screen where um, uh, you would pretty much open your mobile and you will start entering the information like your phone number, uh, your email ID, addresses, uh, at the same time, information about your business, right? So these are pretty standard uh, UI features that you will provide the information. Things get interesting when we talk about the automatic account approval. So for that, what you need to do is to uh, pretty much scan your driving license or the passport or a government ID, right? Um, also, you have to provide the, or you have to click a selfie in order to do that, which you will see as uh, the video progresses. So right here, you will provide a driving license, right? And then uh, you would be taking a selfie. Very soon, you will see uh, one of my colleagues doing that while she was performing the testing operation. Right. So as soon as you do that, so we have APIs uh, which takes care from the background where uh, they will validate your selfie, they will validate the ID information that you have provided. And if everything matches perfectly, immediately you will be able to open the account. And this is how, as you could see here, while we were in call, pretty much the person has opened their account and uh, they would be able to move forward. So literally it took like less than five minutes in order to open the account, right? Yeah, and that, that process also goes with um, uh, receiving an SMS, and then activating that and then requiring the backend for the authentication before the registration is complete. So, so I think that's, uh, I think the, 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 the bit about the, the ID documents. So there was a, a, a range of documents that you can scan, passports, driver's license, and so on. And because of the range of different types of documents that you have to scan and then the selfie capture, um, it was, you, you know, up to that, up to the stage where you decided to look for automation. It, it had to be done manually, right? and it was yep. quite painful, I would imagine. That's, that's definitely right. And this was one of our key challenges as well. Uh, so one of this other interesting journey is the activation of card. So if you just pause that video, Julius, or just go back a little, I want to point out on something on this video. Uh, so if you see on this particular video uh, that in order to capture the card, uh, or yeah, just we can run it through and... Uh, so if you pause it here, I just want to show our audience a little bit. So if you see, as soon as uh, we scan the card, right, or we brought, so pretty much the members, as soon as the card arrives, they would uh, capture the card, right? And uh, as you can see here, that there is no button to capture the card. So pretty much that simply means you have to uh, bring in a validate, a validated card. So you cannot use a dummy card and take a picture of it and it would work. So pretty much API works in a way that you have to use a valid card. Uh, it should be in a perfect position so that automatically this number is there and based on that you would be able to activate it. So that you, you would imagine that will be another challenge first that it should be real card, it should be perfectly positioned and uh, it should be able to read automatically. right? And then you can see that card is activated. So that was another one. And I think this journey you also, before getting to this stage uh, of activating a card, the first, the first challenge was to get biometrics working. And then yeah. obviously that was another challenge that you had to do it manually before on, on both iOS and Android. That's true. That's true. Matter of fact, in order to, uh, I mean, we have both the options, biometric and security, just like your iPhone or Android. But as uh, like most, most of us prefer that we prefer using biometrics. So that would, was a important security features. At the same time, we had to test it so that uh, we want to ensure that whenever a person is scanning their biometrics, they are actually able to authenticate or not authenticate depending upon the scenario. Sure, sure. Right. 
Yeah. And this one is even more interesting compared to others. So, so far we have been talking about, if you just pause this one a little bit, Julie, so that I can talk about this a little more like why this one was crucial for us from automation perspective. So we are mobile first company. Uh, so that simply means uh, that anything that any feature uh, we have been releasing that gets first on the mobile. So we have more features released on mobile. We have few features released on web too. But here is the tricky bit. You cannot directly log on to the web without having your device with you. So we have the QR scanning because of the security we have associated. Uh, because we are mobile first company, web is our secondary and security associated with that. So in order to log into the web, you essentially need the mobile device. So there will be a QR code that you would put in a scan and you would be able to log in using that. Now, here is the challenge. If we want to combine these both journeys through automation, how could you possibly uh, bring or move them together, right? So that was another challenge and very primitive journey. So without we log into web, we cannot do anything. So this was a crucial one for us from automation perspective. Yeah, indeed. And, and you also have to, you know, in automation, when you're thinking uh, of doing that in automation, you have to have a, a platform that enables you to do multi-platform in exactly. the same test, uh, sometimes even more than one platform, right? So in this case, it's two. And, uh, and then, like you said, everything that you, you were to do on the web portal had to be authenticated by the mobile browser. And that QR code changes every, every minute or every two minutes. So it's yeah. not something that you can have like a, a stock test image that even if you could inject the image, you still have to get that image generated on the fly and, and uh, put it into your automation. Yeah, definitely. So, so far, if you talk about the usual automation scenarios, we would see that we log on on a browser on the mobile itself. So we essentially, that's not a cross platform here. We are talking about uh, having a, a desktop talking to a mobile handheld device and that too with a mechanism that pretty much changes like every two minutes, right? So there is no static test data in it. So pretty much we have to think about the strategy or we had to think about a strategy which will uh, pretty much be a runtime. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks very much for walking us through the the scenarios you know the, that you were faced with, and then I guess you know why why automation then? Uh, so we launched our app in two thousand seventeen January. So a couple of years, uh, predominantly we did manual testing. We being startup that time, um, we didn't have a, a robust strategy, but that pretty much led to certain key concerns. As we grew our features, you have seen that we have some exciting features. And every month we are releasing at least two uh, features. So that simply means we are growing with the feature, right? So uh, if we continued doing the manual testing, so th that raised certain concerns like non-competitive time to market. So at some point in 2019, we reached to a point where after a sprint, it used to take five weeks for us to release into production because of the regression testing, because of the beta testing, which was non-competitive and it was uh, way too long. Uh, at the same time, even after that, the releases were at risk. So if you have the longer uh, testing window, what if you find a blocker defect on the last day of testing? That simply means you cannot go with the release. Uh, also, we found ourselves that our product quality was decreasing and that was reflective of the production defect that members were uh, reporting after we release our product. Hotfix, as you know, as soon as we get a production defect, we would like to resolve it ASAP. But at the same time, there is a risk of, always there is a risk of some existing functionality broken. And because of the long regression cycle, uh, the hotfix itself was like a release, which would take like one to two weeks in order to just patch a production problem. Uh, and the last one was motivation of your workforce. Just imagine yourself in a situation uh, where you have to do the repetitive mundane task again and again and again, and uh, pretty much for every defect, you have to repeat the same thing. It's It was uh, demotivating for our QA workforce as well, because everyone wants to be uh, moving towards technical, right? So there were many factors when we decided uh, that our testing strategy needs a complete overhaul. And that's where we decided to have a test automation driven strategy. Yeah, indeed. And, and on the very last point, I, I think you previously mentioned that uh, you know your, your engineers are spending hours on one platform, uh, just testing it manually. And yep. Surely that that must be quite, uh, you know, as you said, quite painful to, uh, and it's not very scalable as well. So. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
so when when we discuss about the strategy, so obvious thing was the technical technical challenges, right? So um, so you can see. So we tried we tried to have an in-house uh, solution, but uh, that's where we started following those challenges. And hence, I showed you that journey so that you can have appreciation. Uh, of the issues that you will see. So for example, in new member registration, right? Capturing an image and selfie, uh, receiving SMS, reading the OTP, entering the OTP, moving on to the security code screen. Um, one journey that you have not seen, which is similar to registration. So as I was saying that for the security reasons, let's say if you change your device, uh, pretty much you will have to recover your account. You cannot just go there and use your uh, email ID and password. This is not how our app works. So like any other banking app you may have. So if you change your device, you pretty much go through a KYC or a security process just to ensure that you are able to recover your account. You just don't log in there. Uh, in activation, you have seen logging using biometrics, capturing and reading cr uh, credit card images. That was another challenge. And tied on web login, we talked quite a bit about that. So that itself was challenge challenging, right? So uh, with those challenges, we started putting our test automation strategy in place. Right. Yeah, so, uh, so when, when, when you're looking, when you realize that you needed, uh, you know, to overcome some technical challenges in, 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 you know, in order to enable automation, what are the other factors, you know, affecting the, the you know, the, the key test strategy and the decision in, yeah. in the approach? Yeah, so in this test strategy, uh, uh, as I was mentioning that it is centered around test automation because that's the only way we could make our testing faster. But at the same time, we didn't want to jump on the scripting right away. We wanted to have a solution which is uh, sustainable, uh, which is forward looking, uh, scalable, because um, now we have three uh, engineering locations. So we started with UK, we expanded our other de delivery center in Sofia, and now we have India as uh, engineering development center as well. So essentially that simply meant that this automation strategy should be scalable at the global level, not only in terms of feature, but also in terms of location. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, our uh, test manager or the QA head, he has created a new team. He had created a new team and named it Autobots uh, because it was pretty much related to robots or uh, doing things automatically. Uh, and you will be uh, very interested to know that this Autobot team was not consisting of only automation engineer or test engineers. So it was comp it comprised of one test automation architect, uh, two uh, test engineers. In addition to that, we brought in one person from iOS and one person from Android. Simply because we know that they know the uh, the application code better, and there would be challenges like that you have seen just now. And development team, uh, we usually ask help. They may not have time, so we wanted to have enough bandwidth so that they can help us. So it was an interesting composition where we. Uh, brought in development uh, and testing together uh, for the automation activity. This is how focused we were, right? And the so team. I do, have, I do have one question here. So, so I presume all, all of the members of the Autobots team have the same virtual background. <laughs> yes, they have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Keep keep <laughs> carry on. Sorry. No worries. Um, and as uh, just brought in the point, so it's pretty much it looks like an Autobots headquarter, right? Um, Yes, so uh, so this team that it was not just formed and not to have a tactical solution, but it was having a certain goals that how do we measure the success, like whether this team was successful or has been successful or not. So we pretty much uh, put those into three categories, the uh, engineering challenges, where we had to put a, a enterprise grade test automation architecture, right? So that we could do mobile automation, we could do web automation, uh, it can have global access, uh, and uh, when needed, we can scale it for continuous testing, CI, CD, and eventually DevOps, right? Time saving was another thing because this is how it all topic initiated. Uh, and we wanted to test it out with our smoke testing, which itself used to take 90 minutes. There were 14 into end UI flows. And you may ask like, why so much of time in unit testing? Uh, so we have eight business areas. And before we start our regression uh, post sprint, we want to make sure that every business area is ready for testing so that itself and every business area has further, further subdivisions. So that was the minimum set that we could think of. And as Julius was explaining, it would take 90 minutes uh, just to test on one platform because of the nature of it. That for every account, you would do either registration or recovery, the test data preparation and do the testing. Right? Uh, so our initial target was 30 minutes. 
but because of seeing the success we had, we brought it down to or revised it to 15 minutes later. And the last one was regression testing time. Um, uh, so as I was explaining that it used to take at least two weeks to three weeks for us to regression testing. So not only automation was going to help us, but we had to do the complete transformation. It was not going to, we didn't want to automate everything uh, which was manual, rather we wanted to have a transformation in uh, regression uh, testing strategy uh, and bring the execution time to less than 45 minutes that we will, you will see how we have achieved it. Excellent, excellent. So, so perhaps walk us through, you know, the, the phase approach you mentioned uh, in our previous conversation that, you know, what, what you, when, it, when approaching yeah. going to automation office is not a, a, something that you can do overnight and, and it's important to go slowly and then, and then you know, sort of expand that as coverage and, and, uh, and then optimize the, the automation and the efficiency in the, your automation pack. So perhaps walk us through the phases. Yeah. Um, so pretty much as uh, uh, most of organizations do, uh, that immediately there is a knee-jerk reaction. That yes, we are spending a lot of time for manual testing. Let's go ahead and uh, you know start doing automation, uh, which I have seen works in a short term where you are able to uh, slow it. I mean, you are able to make it faster, but the problem happens when you want to go to the next level of maturity. Let's say for continuous testing, CI CD, DevOps, and whatnot. At the same time, if without putting any thought process behind automation is done, uh, usually it doesn't uh, work to its potential that it should be. Uh, so that's why we wanted to take it really slow. And we decided, uh, although we, we were suffering that time, but we still wanted to give us uh, time to do that and wanted to do in the phase manner. Uh, so the first phase, so you can see the five phases here and we will learn about those phases uh, a little bit more. So due diligence is pretty much our discovery phase. You know that with that name, design as it says, we wanted to have a design for our uh, overall solution. We did a proof of concept to ensure that whatever design we are uh, doing is going to work, uh, implement, and then integrate it with different components to make it scalable and make it uh, uh, useful for the purpose, right? So we'll do a deep dive. Uh, so in due diligence phase, uh, we actually talked and we talked a lot. We collaborated with different uh, business units, as you can see here, that uh, we kind of created a decision matrix, right? And everyone contributed to that decision matrix. Uh, business units, mobile developers, uh, QA SMEs, and UI integration suit, which was our, the, the baseline. So business units, they, uh, it was pretty much high driven uh, or metrics driven where high value flows were taken into consideration so that we don't miss the big difference. Uh, feature roadmap, like what makes sense in future. So for example, if there is something which is not going to uh, change for a long time, we just didn't want to take it because that doesn't add any value. It doesn't find any different because we are not touching it, right? Um, Similarly, when we talked about mobile developers, we talked about like, what are the problematic areas of the product where you have a uh, complex product, you have complex logic present because that's where you find a, a lot of defects, chances being there, right? Um, similarly, we talked to QA SMEs about uh, their experience with the high defect density in past, what they have seen as a problem, problem child, right? That always it's, it's creating some problem or other. So based on these various factors and taking the baseline of integration suit, which we had like 600, uh, we pretty much reduced that to 48 end-to-end -end UI flows. So as you can imagine how much duplication was there and how much of waste was there uh, at, to be done at the UI level. Uh, so what was there, so we were not uh, doing the 100% coverage, but what we were doing that 80% of member activities were associated with those 48 flows. Although we have so many features, but failure of those flows, those 80% would have been big and expensive from the business perspective. Uh, that simply means that we didn't discard all of that. Rather, we decided to do remaining testing at non-UI level, be it at the unit level, be it at the service level, so that together with the complementing each other, we would be able to have a greater confidence in lesser time. And this particular approach, you know as my Cohen's pyramid, you may have heard it, you may have seen it, but this is how we have actually implemented it from reducing from 600 to 48, less than 10%. Uh, now we are doing at UI level and rest of them are either being done at the developer test level or we are doing automation for them at the service level or UI test level or unit test level, right? 
and as you can see that we have not, uh, uh, this is the beauty of discovery or the due diligence phase, right? So although it's 48, but based on the complexity of different uh, service areas, as I was explaining, we have different business areas. So we have coverage across them based on what the wages of that would be, right? Um, so credit is not big for us. So as of now, we have one end-to-end -end UI2s, which our business area thought that it was enough. Uh, similarly, there are access and marketing, uh, payment services, business services. So we have done the distribution. So in that way, what we have uh, created that whatever we were going to automate, now business knew what we were going to automate, developers knew what we were going to automate, that simply gave them a confidence that whenever that automation would be ready, it will be fit for purpose. Right? So we got into that conversation earlier so that uh, they have more confidence. And all of you, all of us have done automation in the past, and you may have heard this before. Yeah, automation is fine, but how about we do still manual testing? Just because they don't have enough confidence in automation. So that was one importance of due diligence. Uh, design, we wanted to check the fitment of our test automation art infrastructure, right? So we wanted to see how overall uh, test automation fits into the software developer development ecosystem. Um, I have seen in my past experience that we develop wonderful test automation, right? Pretty much we create a diamond. But when it comes to the next level of maturity, uh, at, as an in integration with the developer ecosystem uh, to for the CI CD or DevOps, pretty much what ne they needed was a brick and not a diamond. And just because we thought it was good enough, but it, it's not fit for purpose, right? Fit for the scaling. So it was important for us to understand, do we really need a diamond or do we really need a brick? So this is what designing helped us. Uh, also, it told us like what our key characteristic for uh, automation infrastructure would be. So this is what I talked about the fifth phase, the integration phase, right? So we knew beforehand what we wanted to do integration so that there are no surprises, there were no, uh, uh, you know, failures at that point of time. So we decided what we wanted to integrate much before we, uh, uh, we even developed anything, right? The third one was in terms of like, what are the resources we need? What are the technical, uh, uh, say, software we need? Or what are the, uh, uh, for example, what is the execution that we need, right? Similarly, at that point itself, we were able to identify external dependencies. Like, are we dependent on, let's say, external vendors, or are we dependent on some other team, uh, so that we can give them prior information, we can bring them on the board to make us successful. Right? And outcome of that was this very simplified di diagram of our architecture, as you can see here. Uh, so now, uh, even before, although what we have implemented is exactly this, but at the, when we started the design, this is what it was. So pretty much we didn't have to deviate from anything that we did. So if you see here the uh, automation framework, which is present in a repo, uh, our repo is driven by two pipelines, which is Bitrise and Bitbucket. Uh, in the Bitrise, we do build for iOS and Android uh, repo because this is what the development team uses for a CI CD. So we integrated with that, that we want a solution which can integrate with Bitrise. Similarly, web uses Bitbucket pipeline. So we were uh, we needed a solution which can integrate with both. At the, at the end of it, if you see, we also discovered that we need a device form. Like how would you do a mobile testing if you don't have a device form? So in that way, we were able to identify, uh, you know, like we, what kind of test environment we need. Uh, similarly, you see microservices, you will know why we needed microservices for. Uh, but in that way, we were able to uh, design a system which will be scalable in nature, which will have global access, and pretty much it would serve all the purposes that we needed. Um, now, so a little bit more on device farm. So pretty much what uh, would be the requirement of the device farm, right? That global teams have one access point, and using that, they could uh, access our execution engine, which is very expensive in nature. You don't want to have every engineer to have 10 mobile devices just to test something, right? How about uh, we put them on all the 10 devices on the cloud and everyone can have access depending upon uh, the need. Uh, so with that, um, and also we, you have seen that it was not only that the mobile devices, but pretty much we needed Mac access, we needed Windows access. Uh, so pretty much we needed this execution engine with those requirements. Now there was two options, either we develop something in-house or uh, we involve someone like Perfecto to provide that. So uh, 
by evaluating different combinations, right? We decided to go for third party provider. And I would just say why that enterprise device plan is a specialty. Like you will see multiple players uh, just selling that service. So just imagine for 48 tests, if you would have created a full fledged device form, it would have been cost ineffective. On top of that, there would have been maintenance overhead. Uh, we have to keep track of new devices being released. We have to update them. We have to remove it. So it was just too much of overhead for few end-to-end uh, -end UI tests. And that's why we decided to go for a third party provider. Yeah, there's also <clears throat> a lot of overhead in, in managing, uh, you know, just moving devices from desk or between desks. And, uh, and as, an, as an added bonus, as we now know, in the strange times that we live in, and perhaps something that, that you can later on share with us uh, in the webinar is, you know, how much COVID had imp impacted your, uh, uh, you know, uh, ability to access devices. Um, so now uh, when we designed our systems, it was, but it's still at that time, it was just a concept. There was nothing on the ground. So we wanted to make sure, and as you could see that it needed quite an investment, right? It needed an investment in terms of building up that infrastructure, uh, needed investment in device form, reporting dashboard and whatnot. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we are putting our money in the right place. What's the better way of doing it, uh, uh, you know, other than a proof of concept, right? Uh, so we wanted to, and also you have seen the technical challenges, right? So we wanted to make sure, yes, concept is fine, but we'll be able to overcome those limitations. Uh, also there, as I mentioned, there are multiple device form players in the market. We wanted to select the most suitable one. Um, it needs uh, cost, right? So we wanted to understand what is the value of implementation, whether we'll be able to uh, return anything in, in back or it will be a dead investment. Also, uh, one of the things that we don't think about that, what is what are our legal and data security compliance? Us being a digital banking platform, handling with a lot of member data, it, very important to understand the data security aspect of it, right? So with that, we did a proof of concept. And for that also, we did a very uh, uh, you know, organized approach that you will see in the next slide. Um, but before that, uh, we just talked about it. So I'll just repeat it again, uh, maybe in terms of technical challenges, right? So uh, we have uh, the new member registration. We knew that there were challenges, activating card, uh, logging into web logging, we have discussed it. So just move on to uh, the yeah. approach. So the platform has to be able to uh, support all those technical uh, you know, to, to, to allow you to automate and overcome those technical, I could say blockers, but, you know, challenges. Um, exactly. But is it something that you can also share with us? How, you know, when you were looking for a solution, how how many platforms or providers have you, or did you evaluate? And then in the end, how many did you shortlist before, um, you know, choosing one? Yeah. So to be honest, I don't remember how many we uh, initiated the discussion with, right? Uh, but what I can tell you, uh, what we remember, that we knew what we wanted because we had our design in hand. We knew what our technical challenges were. So we pretty much were very clear because of the due diligence and the design. So which I would really, uh, if anyone is looking to implement such a solution, which I highly recommend, it's time consuming, it's exhausting, I must say, but it's worth. So before even went to, uh, we went to proof and concept stage, we pretty much knew what we wanted to, right? So this is what we pretty much laid out in terms of screening questionnaire, like a uh, lab setup. How would you do the lab setup? What there will be, where will be real devices, emulator, will, will you support Mac? Will you support web? So this kind of questions, right? Uh, what will be your technical support uh, when uh, let's say it's done? Are, are you just saying that, yes, we don't have any technical support. We will just provide a platform. And after that, you are on your own. Uh, what is your data security compliance? Because that's very important for us, especially if we are in UK, we have to be GDPR compliance. We have to ensure that everything is secure. Uh, at the same time, uh, automation is not only about writing the script, but it is also about uh, providing the value to your stakeholders. So what are the analytics and reporting capability of the platform, right? And at the end, of course, the implementation cost. Uh, so with these questionnaires, we went to multiple providers and believe me, all of them have exciting features or exciting things to provide, right? But it is just that what they provide may not match with all of what we wanted, right? And we were very clear. So based on that uh, and based on uh, various, uh, 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 based on their various respond responses, we engaged with, I think, four of them uh, for like a telephonic call or for the presentation with uh, other stakeholders in five. And uh, based on their presentation, based on their knowledge about uh, this particular topic, we selected two of them. 
Uh, and then we got engaged into the hands-on workshop. So we uh, we didn't want to uh, bring them and tell how login works, right? So we clearly told uh, our uh, like all all the uh, participating vendors that these are the scenarios, the four technical challenges that you just saw. That these are things we want and we don't want anything else. At this point, we don't want CI/CD. We don't want to see DevOps capability and whatnot. We just want you to resolve these four problems. Right? Um, so we went into the workshop. It was a, like a physical workshop, unlike these times where everything is online, where we actually sat with the engineers, worked with them, helped them uh, understand at the same time, took information from them and completed the POC in two weeks time. It was a you know, very strict time. Within two weeks, if it was, we were able to prove it, it's fine. Otherwise, you drop the idea. Because we were so clear about it, both the vendors were able to provide uh, you know, information or we were able to co complete POC with us. And then we evaluated based on the predefined success criteria, how many of those challenges have been resolved and, and whatnot. Uh, so now uh, we had to see based on the cost, based on their support. Uh, so based on all of it, we selected Perfecto as a partner for the device farm and we are doing a webinar together down the line, almost nine months. Uh, so, but it was not only the technical challenge why we selected Perfecto, uh, but there were a few other factors which you can call as soft factors, but very crucial. Uh, that they have enterprise uh, grade lab setup, right? So it can, it's very elastic. So you can increase if you want. So not only scalable, but you can decrease if you want. Uh, I mean, based on the contractual agreement that you may have, but there is a possibility. Uh, they helped us in um, solving a lot of blocking challenges that you have seen. Their platform has that capability, uh, which the other vendor was not able to resolve all of them. They were able to make some success, but not all of it. Um, what we saw during the engagement that Perfecto is very motivated for client success. They took this POC as um, an important project and pretty much everyone was involved there to make it successful, not just for business, uh, but just to see us going through that. Uh, at the same time, I won't say Perfecto was able to resolve all of them, all of the challenges that we had, but at the same time, one uh, or two issues that we had, they were very transparent and very clear in communication, which you would expect from your partner, to be honest. Um, and then a strong technical support team. So to, when we started with all of the topics that you, you saw were challenges, but within two weeks, Perfecto was able to come up with a solution. So although we were working with a couple of engineers uh, during workshop, but you can sense that there is a strong uh, support from background of a technical uh, support team, which was able to resolve the things within hours, if not days. Right. So with all, all those soft factors and success of POC, we decided to go with Perfecto and we couldn't be any happier. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that that you raise a really good point that that's very often overlooked by uh, you know uh, you know the people who are also in your same boat or in the same boat as, as you were looking for for a solution. They they sometimes focus on the solution rather than the actual team behind the solution. You know, are you going to get the human resources that you will need to uh, in order to use it successfully? I think that's a very important factor as well. Yep. And this transparent communication helped and our, the way our team was set up, we knew, we knew from the beginning that doesn't matter which, uh, uh, you know, uh, partner we select, but there will be some challenges, right? And that's why we had the mobile developers embedded because they could pretty much tweak the app so that whatever the blocking challenges were there, uh, we can overcome them or provide a, you know, very constructive or creative solution. So with uh, the POC was very successful one for us because we were able to find a very suitable, very capable partner out of this POC. At the same time, with the help of Perfecto platform and mobile developers, we were able to overcome all the blocking challenges that you have seen and we didn't have anything or, and, and you will see how uh, we were able to overcome all of them, right? And based on this POC success, we knew that our idea is going to work. We decided to go ahead and uh, invest into it, right? Um, so based on also, we decided to go for a cloud-based solution. Um, and why? Uh, I don't have to uh, spell out all of it, but uh, pretty much uh, you could see that we are going for bit rise, bit bucket, cloud-based. Uh, with Perfecto coming into picture, we didn't have to go for like uh, in-house solution, which is again cloud-based. Uh, so that simply means that overall, we could uh, be a 100% cloud-based uh, solution, which I take a very pride in saying that that none of our components reside on any of uh, any ma one's machine. And pretty much any of that component can be accessed from anywhere in the world. Like now, I'm just accessing it from my home. Uh, similarly, someone uh, from my team working in India can do that. 
And if I decide to, uh, you know, just work from Miami, let's say I can do that and there will not be any problem, right? So that simply tells us about global collaboration. We can automate from anywhere. It talks about shared access, right? Uh, easy integration, as I mentioned, that our crowds, uh, our other solutions are also cloud-based. So, uh, and all these cloud-based solutions have these integration points. So, if everything was on cloud, it was just easy to integrate, right? Um, it would be, you know, always on. Uh, in addition to that, we also decided on certain tech stack, uh, and there, there is a reason why. I'll just briefly go through them. Uh, test automation framework, we decided to go for quantum. Quantum is an open source framework based on Qmetry. A lot of you may know that. And perfect to provide this solution and they own it. Uh, the beauty of quantum is that because we decided to go with Perfecto, so it comes with inbuilt uh, integration. And also it has various capabilities for test reporting, for parallel executions and whatnot. And it just helped us in doing fast onboarding with Perfecto. And uh, yeah, so that's why we decided to for that framework. For tool, uh, although Quantum supports a lot of automation tools, uh, but we decided to go for APM because our app is on um, iOS and Android both. Uh, so we decided to go for it so that we could, we could use uh, the same code base for both of them. So if we would have gone for, uh, let's say, uh, Espresso or let's say for X2, I guess, we would be very platform specific, right? Java, uh, we want, our backend is developed on Java. So it made sense for us to go for Java as opposed to any other programming language and why it helped because whatever the solution that our backend engineers have developed, we could just use it for our best automation. Uh, Bitbucket is selected as a version control repository because it's for easy collaboration. It has built-in continuous tool and it is the developer's choice as well for the one version controlling. And the last one is related to Sonar Cloud. As you would all know, Sonar Cloud is used for uh, static code analysis and using that, we were able to maintain a very high quality of our code. Right. Uh, our framework is very, uh, why we call it enterprise grade because as you could see, it's very, uh, uh, modular in nature, right? Uh, so we created a base of building blocks where we have except, uh, you know, custom exception, we have listeners, utilities, we have models, personas, microservices uh, at, at the building block level. So using that, we can pretty much automate mobile, we can pretty much use uh, web, we can pretty much use any automation for that matter, right? So as of now, while uh, this deck was prepared, we were using this model shows for uh, mobile, but we started the similar one, as you can assume here, would be web that we started uh, using the same base of utilities. Similarly, we can do for backend. And in future, if there are, let's say, other platform that we need to test, we can just scale it because of the model of it. Uh, yeah. And one important thing that uh, you may have seen is pretty much related to uh, some modules. It's a exciting uh, uh, component where uh, we pretty much can do testing independent of the build. So using the sub modules, we can anytime on demand, we can bring in the app into our framework and build the application in our pipeline and execute them. So we are not dependent on the developers. Okay. Uh, so with that, uh, we completed our smoke test execution. So although it took some time for us to build all the framework setup, a smoke test execution. So 14 of them, we were able to do that in two months. Uh, the best practices that we followed were pair programming, we did a static code analysis with Sonar Cloud, and we had consistent full merge requests. So it needed uh, approvals, it needed, uh, you know, so that you could produce the report and we continuously tested. So whatever was integrated, immediately an automatic execution happened, which ensured that everything is working fine. <laughs> And this is the next phase where uh, we integrated different solutions. So as I mentioned that we identified during our design, what are those components? And as you can see, as we started our journey, we started doing integration of those components. So Perfecto was the first, then we included microservices, Bitbucket pipeline, Bitrise pipeline. Uh, with those pipeline setup, we started doing continuous smoke testing, like every night we would do that. Then we had Sonar Cloud integration for static code analysis. We started putting custom exceptions custom reporting, and now we have started with the continuous regression testing. Like every night we do regression testing on our development building branches. So maybe it's time to uh, to see in action. Yes, so this is the Bitrise pipeline that I talked about. So if you see the last one is the specialized app where uh, we 
pretty much uh, developers had provided us a custom app where uh, it has certain testing capability. And why we did that? So that by mistake also, we don't promote it to production. Our testing app did not go to production. So for that matter, uh, we created our own app within Bitrise. And now uh, we would be able to, uh, from the workflow, we can pretty much go and see what's happening, what we can uh, uh, execute every night against the develop and release, right? So if you can see here, if you want a manual uh, execution, you can do that using this configuration. If you see, we have a scheduled job uh, at one o'clock every night, we run against the current develop branch. And at three o'clock, we run against every release branch. So if there are any changes in those uh, branches, and if you see any breaking changes, the next morning we can do that. So this is how we are doing continuous testing. So every night, the new code base is being changed. So this setup is from Android. We uh, clone our repository, we generate the APK bundle, we deploy into the Perfecto, and we run in Perfecto. So as you can see, it is end-to-end -end completely, completely automated process with no manual intervention anywhere, right? And similar is for iOS. So in that way, we are able to run those both the platforms in parallel, and all the devices in Perfecto gets fired up at 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock to create up this stuff. Right? And this is an example, like as soon as the build is done, as you can see at the top, as the uh, test goes increases, uh, we increase the devices. So you can see a combination of mobile, Android. And in a little bit, you will see that web is also firing up. Just have a look. Yes, so now it's 20. So we have, uh, you know, uh, nine mobile devices, nine Android devices, nine iOS, iOS devices we have configured. And at the same time, those devices sometimes use for web login, there are certain scenarios, so they use cross platforms. As you can see, that it's purely parallel execution. You can see those execution happening, and that's how we were able to speed our process so much. Right. So now this is the uh, uh, various reporting one that I was talking about. That uh, reporting capabilities. So here you see the CI, which is for iOS and Android, and you would see different timing. And if you see, they are very consistent around thirty minutes. Similarly for Android, very consistent around between 25 to 30 minutes, depending upon how the performance has been. So this is how every execution, every night's nice execution would look like. As you can see uh, here, you will see the time against which build it was executed. You can use different tags for the reporting purposes, right? And this is the interesting one, right? So here we can tag this custom reporting or exceptions that I mentioned. So using that, we can, if there are existing defects, we can mention. If certain test has failed, when uh, it is not tagged to a any particular defect, that simply means there is a problem in the application. As soon as we see anything which is not tagged to custom exception, we will be reported to the uh, development team, or they can pretty much look into Perfecto and they know that they need to fix it. So this is how strong the reporting with Perfecto would be. And you only really need to pass around the unique URL for everyone to get everything they need from that. Precisely. Yeah. So it is a self-service one. You can pretty much do whatever you want with the reporting uh, and it's an information, right? So by doing that, we, uh, we achieved some very exciting uh, key results that I'm going to uh, walk you through in the coming slides. So to start with, uh, the first one was the goal itself is to reduce the smoke test time. So just to remind that our goal was to bring it down from 90 minutes, approximately 90 minutes to 30 minutes before and by seeing the results we further reduced it to 15 minutes. So as you can see here that before, which is as of March 11th, if we had to do a smoke testing within 30 minutes, we needed three testers and they would take around 28 minutes to complete it. That is 84 minutes in total. After, which is as of August 27, 14 tests automated, a two tests manual, and the duration has been 11 minutes. So pretty much from 84 minutes, we have gone down to 11 minutes, which is 87% decrease in a smoke test execution. So pretty much we smashed all the records that we had to do or whatever we wanted to achieve. Okay, so moving on. Uh, so as uh, I was explaining that in terms of regression tests, we didn't automate all 600 uh, as is. So pretty much we did a transformation. We optimized our regression testing itself. So that simply means we don't have a baseline like man one baseline, but what we can do is approximation. So in terms of automation, those 48 flows or that I was talking about the 40 tests that has been implemented so far uh, for Android, it would take around 378 minutes if the same test is done manually. 
that is an approximation. Similarly, if you want to run the same test in iOS, that would take around 360 minutes. But with automation that you are seeing right now, it is for iOS, it takes 37 minutes. For Android, the same time is 28 uh, minutes or 29 minutes. So that simply means for in case of Android, we are saving 92%. And in case of Android, we are saving 89% if we had to do the same test manually. But because it is optimized, so we never had to do it manually. And every time we do it through uh, automation. Right? Now, continuous testing is something I talked about. So every night when we do the execution on develop branch, release branch, that simply means that next day we have a feedback available on the latest code base, be it developed, be it the release branch. So that simply means what it was taking earlier for the complete sprint to happen and then provide a feedback on existing functionality. Now we can provide feedback on a nightly basis to our developers. And that simply means uh, our developers, if any breaking changes they have introduced, they would know it right away instead of knowing it uh, very later in the phase. So this is how we have shifted our defect detection left in the software development cycle. And as we know, as much we can shift our defect detection to left, easier and cheaper it is to uh, fix, right? Um, so now uh, the very interesting question always asked is what is the cost saving? So we have taken a very simplified call calculation based on just the continuous testing we are doing and based on uh, the percentage I showed you on the regression test. Uh, so manual execution time for 48 test, if it is both for iOS and Android, it would have been 1.5 days if one person was executing. So considering that we are doing these execution on two branches, which is develop and release. So every night we would need 3% to do what we are doing today. So that simply means we are saving 3% per uh, uh, person effort per night. And if, even if we just take not the everyday execution, but even if we take just the working days, so that brings us to 720 percent days per year. And by taking a daily rate of 200 pound per day for a QA analyst in London, that calculates to 144. And this is very conservative, just taking the bare minimum. We are not even considering the ad hoc testing that we do. We are not taking uh, uh, into consideration uh, uh, the daytime testing that we do. So it is the minimum saving that we are getting per year. Amazing. Right. So I mentioned that Sonar Cloud we have integrated as our uh, ecosystem. What the benefit has been, if you can see that we have 19,000 lines of code and out of that 19,000 lines of code, we don't have any bug. We don't have any vulnerability. We don't have any security problem. So this is how we ensure that our code quality is very high. We are ma making sure that there is no vulnerability for any attack on our uh, testing assets. What you see here, there are five code smells because there are certain portion of the code which is very difficult to get rid of. And that's why there are five code smells because of the cyclomatic complexity that we get a little bit more if and else statements uh, just because of the nature of the application. And pretty much that also has led to certain amount of duplication. And if you see, it is just 1.2%. So for a 19,000 lines of uh, test automation code base 1.2% and we always maintain uh, that ratio and uh, we make sure that we don't include any uh, any bug any vulnerable vulnerability or any new duplication okay. now these are some stats which will reflect on uh, how this overall impact has been uh, or overall effort has impacted a few important aspects right uh, so one of the things that I talked about, the uh, deteriorating production uh, quality. So in the beginning of this year, we used to get like 10 to 15 production defect. So if you leave the outlier, which I'll just let you know in a minute, now we are ranging in, let's say, three to five defects. So if, if we ignore May and June timeframe, and if we uh, build a, uh, a trend line, it would look like that we have we have been reducing continuously from 15 to 10 defects to let's say three to five defects uh, on the platform. Now, as in, in UK, uh, because of the coronavirus impact, there was a bounce back uh, loan scheme which was uh, introduced by, uh, by, the, by the government. And that's where we had to accelerate our release. And the priority at that time for the business was to put 
uh, the feature into uh, into production. So that's why a lot of uh, quality slippage was present, which has resulted into these production defects. And hence, these are the outliers. Okay. Uh, similar outliers you will see uh, when we talk about time to market as well, but just ignoring that, if you see in the beginning of year, that was our release 2.47, uh, we were trending around 18 to 25 days time to market, like when the split ends to the general availability. Now, eventually we have been able to bring it down to around, let's say 14, 15, yeah, 14 days. So that means we are able to release our product five to seven days sooner because of the introduction of the automation. So what we have not been able to do and which is out of our control is like preview or the beta members. So this is why you will not, you are not able to see that steep uh, change. But if you talk about uh, in general regression effort itself, so what the regression testing that we were doing earlier in two weeks time frame, now we are able to bring it down to two to 2.5 days. And that's why we are able to release the product into market sooner. Yeah. And this is what I was just talking about, uh, 16 fewer percent days. So because of uh, the saving on per platform, of close to uh, eight days per platform. So this is how we are able to save 16% uh, days per plat, 16% uh, days in total per sprint in the regression testing itself, uh, which by the way, was not calculated uh, during that calculation so that you can imagine that our saving is much more than 144,000. Okay, so the most exciting one, the biggest challenge for us was the COVID-19 impact, and this has been our the biggest success as well. And the reason uh, I have uh, provided you the screenshot, because uh, as I was showing you the timeline, that February end was the time when we completed our framework implementation. And immediately after that, 18 March was the date when our office, our, our office announced to close it formally in, in London. So you can see from the screenshot that we have uh, merges present in our code base on 18th March, on 19th March, on 20th, 23rd March by all the team members. So what does that show that we had zero impact on the project delivery? So, and, and the testimony of the same is that we were able to complete our project within the specified time frame with a better result. So I would just say, uh, although we didn't plan for a COVID-19 pandemic, but the way our strategy has been, if it would have been any different strategy, I would not know what the impact would have been. But because of this strategy, we didn't have any impact on the project delivery, although we were in middle of it when the pandemic hit us. Uh, the additional advantage of that was remote onboarding of India Associates. So during that time, we were scaling up in India as well. Uh, so that time, uh, as you know, there were we all were in the shortage of hardware. So few of the associates were uh, onboarded using Mac machine, which is important to have if you want to uh, automate on a real iOS device. But because of all this, because of all our in infrastructure being on cloud, because of perfect integration uh, with us, we were able to onboard people even with a Windows machine. So pretty much they were able to use Windows to automate iOS devices, which were present on the Perfecto lab. So in that way, we have uh, made our overall automation architecture platform independent. We have made our overall architecture location independent, which has helped us a lot during this pandemic. And we were able to deliver this project to a great success. So now in terms of uh, the challenges um, that we faced, uh, that this device coverage. So for example, what as, as a mobile company, it's important to know our member base. So how would you uh, do that? So in that uh, data team helped us where, and uh, also uh, Perfect Code provides a very useful report where they provide the market trend. So pretty much using that, we were able to decide what are the uh, current user base and what is going to be the future trend. So based on that, we were able to uh, decide what test or how, like what 20 devices we need to take pretty much, right? Um, the second challenge was related to tight internal systems. Like uh, you cannot just access the database without accessing a VPN and implementing a VPN in cloud was a challenge. So in that's where you see the microservices coming into picture where we have created public facing APIs uh, with the help of our backend team. And now we can just use it and they are very specific in nature. They don't go to production and they are not reflective of our internal system. So it's very secure in nature. Parallel execution, uh, as you would know that there is always a, a tendency of parallel execution is the data conflict. 
this is what again microservice helped us where uh, different tests would talk to each other with the means of microservice and this is how they would know what tests to use and what not to uh, triaging and reporting uh, we have very powerful reporting that is provided by perfect so that challenge is resolved and last was the test data setup uh, as i was explaining that uh, it takes a lot of time for us to do registration recovery so with the help of development team we were able to do the custom app so this is why we have a separate app so with uh, with that team we don't have to go through all 50 steps to do a registration or recovery rather it's all in background and with one additional screen i would be able to uh, uh, just do the test data setup so compared to 5 minutes that used to take for data setup now it takes like 20 seconds right and technology challenges we just discussed biometrics image captures uh, so with combination of plat perfect to platform and capability from developers we were able to resolve them yeah it was it, it, probably one of the key one of the key challenges was was the first of all the platform has to be able to support those features on both ios and android yeah uh, now it comes like how it is going to help us for the long term objective uh, so our long term objective or the engineering goal is to have zero member facing defects uh, so it is not only regression which is going to help us. There has to be certain changes in the other areas. But what this does, our end-to-end -end UI test automation that we did, it tells the problem in the 80% of area, which are like big defects. So we know that most of the member, if, if at all, will face problem into this journey. At the same time, now development team is trying to complement the remaining 20%, which may not be high priority, but at the same time, it will complement the 80% high importance journey. So in that way, with help of UI tests that we have developed now, and with the combination of developer tests, we will be able to ensure that we don't have any member facing defect, right? And the second one is app release on demand, every day required. So I'm talking about going from five uh, weeks of release cycle to one day of release cycle. But that cannot happen if we don't have a very strong uh, test automation strategy in place. And this is where UI comes into picture and gives us a confidence from the user perspective that yes, even if you release it today, user won't have problem in let's say 80% of the defects. At the same time, developers, what they are testing, they won't have. Uh, uh, with that, we will be able to release on demand every day if you need it. Right? So in that way, whatever work we have done, whatever the test automation strategy we have created, is aligned to our long-term objective. Okay. So, um, so perhaps share with us, you know, what what other lessons you, you've learned in the experience, and uh, you've previously mentioned, you know, working with Perfecto as a partner. I think that uh, falls into falls into your uh, category of cross-organization collaboration. Perhaps what are the you know cross-team and cross-organization uh, you know lessons that you would you like to share with us? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we are sharing the lesson learned based on a successful project or not based on the failure. So not every, uh, not this all has been with, uh, uh, you know, learning lessons, right? So as I talked about it, collaboration, uh, working with the developers, working with the data team, working with the business team is very important. And uh, as one of uh, my agile coaches told me that not every problem is yours to solve. Yes, you identify the issue, but at the same time, you need to seek help if you want to be successful because success is everyone's responsibility, right? So that's where we understood that early, thankfully. And that's where as soon as we have the problem, we would reach out to uh, the team members, we would tell them the problem and the problem would be resolved earlier, right? So it can be the team within our organization, within tight development or uh, backend content can be anyone. Similarly, it can be cross organization, perfect to being a partner, if we are not seeing any solution within, we would reach out to them as well. And they would come up with certain solution what platform offers. So that collaboration is very important if you want to be successful and not get stuck to some problem, right? The second one was data-driven decision-making. So as I was mentioning that there were certain time where we were not sure of what to do, for example, selecting the device. So in those cases, data is important. At the same time, if we want to improve, data is important. And this is why I was able to show some of the statistics, right? If we didn't have the data from the beginning, I was not able to say that this project was successful. Uh, so it's very important, the people uh, or the teams who are trying to get that, please capture the data, also utilize the existing data. In that way, you will be able to make a decision which can be really a game changer. All right, well, thanks thanks very much for uh, for today. I think that's, that's all the time that we have for today, but uh... 
you know, I just like to take this opportunity again to to thank the shock. I mean, who, who has now actually become a, a, a more more of a personal friend than than the, than a colleague, you know, of, of of across two different organizations. So thank you very much again, and uh, and I hope our audience has learned a lot from this webinar. Thank you. And if you have any question, as you have the email IDs, uh, if you want to get into a conversation, please feel free to write me. Thank you. Thanks for having me here, Julius. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.